Shalom. In this week's Torah portion of Truma, beginning in Exodus chapter 25, God begins to give Moshe instructions for the creation of a sanctuary. As verse 8 sums it up, And they shall make for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. The remainder of the book of Exodus will be focused on the divine instructions for creating and operating this sanctuary. While traveling through their way stations in the wilderness, this mitzvah is originally fulfilled through the modest, temporary structure of the Mishkan, the desert tabernacle. And the tabernacle also accompanied the children of Israel into the land, functioning as the sanctuary in various locations, until finally the Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple, was established at its permanent location on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. This whole idea is amazing and new for man and a huge change for the world. And as our sages teach, God desired a dwelling place down below. And really, from the very beginning of creation, it's always been about this dream of God's, to be welcomed into the world by man, to fix the relationship, to bring the romance back, to fix what happened in the Garden of Eden. God thought about the Holy Temple before creating the world, the Talmud teaches. And the place of the Holy Temple is the center of creation. And building this sanctuary was really the reason for the Exodus, and for the splitting of the sea, and for the Sinai Revelation, and for coming into the land. Through this very physical structure that we are commanded to establish, God promises to rest his presence among man. Now, the very first vessel that the children of Israel are commanded to create is the Ark, alternatively referred to in Torah as the Ark of the Covenant and also as the Ark of the Testimony. Details are given for the construction of the Ark, its cover, and the two cherubim. And we read, They shall make an Ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall cover it with pure gold. From within and without you shall cover it. And you shall make on, on top of it a gold crown all around. So this idea of within and without you shall cover it means that the ark was actually fashioned of three separate boxes, two of gold and one of wood. The wooden box was placed inside the golden box, and into the wooden box was placed a golden box. The upper rims were coated with gold, as it's written, and you shall coat it with pure gold. And a cover of gold was placed over it, and four golden rings were set in it, two on the north and two on the south, into which the ark's staves were inserted. These badim, staves or poles, were to remain permanently attached to the ark. As the verse states, the staves shall be within the rings of the ark, they shall not be removed from it. So open up your heart. God's commandment to Israel to build a place for him in this world is so novel because it means that we are able to do this, that ordinary human beings can partner with God, as it were. It may strike us as somewhat ironic that the ark is the very first vessel that we are cre commanded to create. Hidden from everyone, like the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, the ark, containing the tablets of the law that Moshe received at Mount Sinai, is really the heart of the Holy Temple. And ostensibly, it can be seen somewhat otherworldly to us. In Hebrew, the ark is called aron, derived from the word or, meaning light. It's literally a box of light, a receptacle to hold light, because the original light of creation is concentrated, is hidden in the ark. This light is the source of sanctity and spiritual inspiration for the whole world. And the tablets of the law contained within the ark transforms the Holy Temple experience into a continuation of the Sinai Covenant experience. Torah also refers to it as the Ark of the Testimony because the tablets are the testimony of the covenant between the Holy One, blessed be He, and Israel, a testimony of the unbreakable bond of love that exists between them. It was in the Ark's presence that God revealed Himself to Moshe, for between the two golden cherubim on the Ark's cover is the dwelling place of the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. With the Luchot Abrit, the tablets of the covenant inside, and the Kruvim, the cherubim above, the ark constantly testifies to the giving of the Torah, and the Kruvim, made of gold, recall the fire of Sinai. Now everybody always asks, where is the ark today? Tradition records that even as King Solomon built the first temple, he already knew, through prophetic divine inspiration, that eventually it would be destroyed. And so Solomon, the wisest of all men, oversaw the construction of a system of mazes and chambers and corridors underneath the Temple Mount. And he commanded that a special place be built in the bowels of the earth where the sacred vessels of the Temple could be hidden in case of approaching danger. 
Chronicles 2, chapter 35 and verse 3 alludes to the fact that King Josiah of Israel, who lived about 40 years before the destruction of the first temple, commanded the Levites to hide the ark together with the original menorah and several other items in this secret hiding place which Solomon had prepared. Those other items are the staff of Aaron that brought forth almond blossoms during the controversy involving Korach in number 16, and the jar of manna that had been placed in the Holy of Holies as a testimony, and the jar of anointing oil. And this location is recorded in our sources, and today there are those people who have always known exactly where this chamber is, and we know that the ark is still there, undisturbed, and waiting for the day when it will be revealed. But we digress. Thus far, we understand that the Ark of the Covenant is the nucleus of the Holy Temple, and that God commanded Israel to create it to serve as a receptacle for the tablets of the law that Moshe would bring down from Mount Sinai. This literal box of light somehow serves as a spiritual portal, figuratively, of course, but aiding somehow in man's rendezvous with the divine. So now open up your heart in the deepest way. The Ark is the exception to every rule, out of the tens of commandments relating to the Mikdash and its furnishings, <clears throat> the ark is the only vessel which was commanded by God in the plural. They shall make an ark of acacia wood, Exodus 25.10. In fact, the only other temple commandment we find in the plural is verse 8, and they shall make for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. Thus, somehow the ark, like the temple itself, represents the unity and binding together of all of Israel. Another exception all the other vessels are used to perform some aspect of the divine service, either daily, such as the kindling of the menorah and the offering of incense on the golden altar, or weekly, such as the placement of the loaves of the, on the table of the showbread. But no service is made with the ark. Only the high priest enters into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle the blood, and even that is only in the proximity of the ark. The ark was created to serve as a container. It's the only temple vessel whose purpose is to be a receptacle. Also note that the other vessels in the sanctuary are all situated, they're placed lengthwise. Only the ark is to, is to be placed by its width. This was in order to enable the two poles to extend until they slightly touch the curtain between the holy and the holy of holies. This itself is very, very deep, and it's a whole nother lesson. The poles on the ark facilitated its transportation until it reached its permanent location. Yet there is a special commandment never to remove the poles from the ark, even in the holy temple, even though they were no, no longer needed to carry it. And this was so that the protrusion of the poles could slightly be seen in the sanctuary touching the curtain. Now, numerous unusual events surrounding the ark are recorded in Torah such as the plague visited upon the Philistines when the ark was captured, as described in the book of Samuel, and the death of Uzzah when the ark was being brought to Jerusalem. But open up your heart deeper than ever. An amazing tradition testifies the ark was a no min hamidah, meaning the ark was not measurable. It did not occupy any physical space. That is, its dimensions could not have fit within the Holy of Holies. With the measured wingspan of the two cherubim, the ark could not possibly have fit within the small area of the Holy of Holies. This also informs us that the ark revealed an element that transcended space. Now, in addition to this idea as it relates to the ark, this concept of transcendence, of being unbound by the limitations of space, was also manifest in the Holy, in the Holy Temple when the pilgrims who ascended to the temple, in the words of the Mishnah, would stand packed together and crowded together in the courtyard. But when the moment came for everyone to fully prostrate themselves as they heard the awesome, ineffable name of God pronounced by the high priest, then all of a sudden there was ample room for everyone to perform this act of devotion without one person unsettling the next. And by the way, this is considered as one of the ten miracles that took place in the second temple, as recorded in chapter, Chapters of the Fathers, chapter 5. And moreover, our sages relate that the ark was not carried, but rather the ark lifted its bearers, despite the fact that it was very heavy and it had its contents of the tablets of the law. Not only did it not need to be carried, we're taught that it lifted and bore those who carried it. But the greatest miracle of all we, found, we find associated with the ark's staves. When Joshua was, was preparing the people to cross the Jordan into the land of Israel, in chapter 3 and verse Verses 9 and 10 of Joshua, he said to the children of Israel, Come here 
and hear the words of Hashem your God. Through this, you will know that the living God is in your midst. Citing the Midrash, Rashi explains the meaning of these words, come here. Joshua gathered everyone in between the two poles of the ark. And this is an example of the principle of a little which holds a lot. Again, meaning an idea of a transcendence of space. So make sure your heart is open deeper than ever before in your life. Do you understand what we're being told here? Come here, said Joshua. And he gathered the entire nation of Israel in between the two poles of the ark. And he told them, through this, you will know that the living God is in your midst. The fact that the space between the two poles of the ark somehow held all of you, it shows you that the Shekhinah of the Holy One, blessed be He, is among you. This is an idea of, of the revelation of godliness, which is beyond the borders of reality. The very essence of the ark is beyond the confines of nature, and thus through it, a glimpse into the true nature of reality, the presence of Hashem, is revealed in this world. When Israel was on the threshold of her entry into the land, Joshua elevated them to this level of understanding. And this is the same super-reality that was experienced in the temple every day. In the same manner that the ark occupied no space within the Holy of Holies and lifted its bearers, and just as they stood crowded but bowed down amply, so too Joshua revealed the spiritual root, the vortex of the dimension of holiness between the poles of the ark. The super-reality that would later be revealed through daily life in the Holy Temple was hidden between the poles. But we mustn't overlook the most amazing thing of all. The children of Israel built this ark out of the simple materials that they brought with them from Egypt under the harsh conditions of the desert. This box of divine light, the dwelling place of the divine presence in this world, in between whose two poles the entire nation of Israel, men, women, and children, were able to gather was not created by superhumans. It was created by simple, God-fearing people who sought to honor and fulfill the Creator's will. This is the, base of, the basis of our relationship with the Almighty. God commands and we fulfill. And man is able to activate Hashem's will through simple obedience. And the Ark, the very heart of the Holy Temple and the resting place of the Shekhinah, from where the Creator would manifest His loving presence, it was given over to Israel to create so that there could be a revelation of godliness in this world. This is the beauty, the challenge, and the privilege of being a person in Hashem's world. To do our best to sanctify and elevate the material, and to do our best to make our world into a place for the Divine Presence. Thank you for watching this week's video on Parshat Truma. I'd love to hear from you, any feedback or questions or comments. And may we all truly merit to make this world into a dwelling place for the Divine Presence. May we truly merit to rebuild the Holy Temple in our time. Thank you for being part of the Jerusalem Lights community. Shabbat Shalom.